research in behavior genetics. The talk I'm giving today is uh, not going to contain much data, but uh, instead I'm, I'd like to inform you about recent activities in uh, the Saarland University trying to uh, find new ways to model multigroup data. This is a quick overlook of what I'm going to talk about. And the uh, GSMGD is that acronym that I'm going to come back to every once in a while. Um, I think we are all um, in agreement about the powerfulness of the uh, classical twin design. And at the same time, it's a design that is limited. It comes with assumptions, and it comes with a couple of restrictions. Proponents say that the limitations do not negate the usefulness of twin studies, but have been suggested in extended designs. Extended designs, for example, allow to estimate parameters that are not um, that you cannot estimate in the classical twin design at the same time. For example, non-additive genetic effects and shared environment. It's also possible to consider uh, genome environment interaction and correlation. And, of course, as uh, Dorette al already pointed out, you can have a look at assortative mating and to what extent, for example, twin-specific effects might affect your results. There's a couple of very recent papers on the powerfulness of uh, extended designs. Um, and at the same time, if you're doing behavior genetics in a country such as Germany, where you do not have a central twin register, um, it's sometimes rather difficult to come up with data sets that are informative to the extent that you would like them to be. Um, so what we thought about was, is there any way that we can, for example, collaborate with other studies that have an inherently genetically informative design, but that have not been using uh, this powerful feature. And we came up with uh, the question, can we collaborate with people doing panel studies? For example, in Germany, there is a, um, an ongoing panel study. It's called the ZOEP, the Socioeconomic Panel. It's been around since 1984. On a yearly basis, these people <laughs> Um, interview 11,000 households, including more than 20,000 persons. This data, or this data set, covers a wide range of subjects. And um, interestingly enough, um, since about 2000, 2003, they have started bringing in more psychological constructs. So on the sociological side and the uh, side of economists, there is increasing interest to bring in psychological knowledge. And we thought that's a great opportunity to collaborate and start talking. Um, as you can see, I'm not going to name all of these, but for example, personality traits uh, have been assessed in the SOAP in 2005 and have just been assessed the second time in 2010. And of course, because there were sociologists who invented this panel study, uh, they include a lot of variables related to the environment, as we would term it. Another nice feature of the Zillow is they offer the data for free. So they give it to you, um, basically you send them an email and you receive a DVD uh, with the data. That is not saying it's ready to use for behavior geneticists right away, because another funny feature, um, they did not quite record whether these people living in the household, for example, if that was a 15-year-old, was a biological child. But you would have to go through other information to kind of make sure that these people are biologically related, and that takes some time. So it's not a ready-to-use approach, but the data is there. So it was not designed to be genetically informative, far from it, but it could be used as such. So what we did, and we started that effort in about, uh, for, um, about two years ago, is uh, try and take full sibling data, mother-child diet data, and grandparent-grandchild diets from the ZOEP, and combine these with twin data that we uh, assessed ourselves. Because if you look at the percentage of twins in the original ZOEP, that's far too small a group. Uh, we used twins, or we contacted twins from earlier twin studies of ourselves, we did contact them again because we wanted to make sure that they were receiving the same measures that were assessed in the SOA, so to have a, a measurement equivalence. 
We contacted them, we asked them to complete these measurements online or via mail, and, um, and this is the first step really. I mean, I'm talking about the, the very first data that we're having a look at. Um, we compared models using only our twin data and um, results from this GSMGD design using latent factors for this talk I use personality. But there will be a talk tomorrow that will also include life satisfaction. And um, one nice feature of this model is that you can, for example, allow for different environmental estimates. You can test this twin-specific effect, but you could also go a, one step further and test intergenerational effects. The model, and I'm very grateful to Tim that you um, mentioned the univariate models again, because I'm not showing anything else. There's not going to be a multivariate analysis today for me. But the nice feature is you can estimate D and C at the same time, including the um, possibility to set the path between the latent C influences free for a couple of groups or compare them across analysis. Now this is the data set I'm going to talk about. It's not as huge as the Dutch data and it's quite impressive so I was uh, rather humble in my seat when, when the Red talked about that. But still, it's uh, quite, for German com uh, standards, quite a big sample. And uh, just to make this comment, uh, we only use 400 sibling pairs, roughly, and 400 mother-child diets at this stage, but this is only like 10% of the full available sample. Uh, these are issues we need to talk about. Should we try and um, reflect the proportions of, say, siblings and twins in the population, um, and, but risking in the structural equation modeling a certain bias towards the sibling groups? Or should we do it the other way around and try to come up with uh, rather even-sized groups? Um, that is an open issue, and I'm happy to discuss this with, with the experts in the room. Here's just a couple of correlations, and I picked three um, constructs from the Big Five model, neuroticism, extroversion, and conscientiousness. And jumping to the results for extroversion, we find comparable results for both the classical twin design analysis and the GSMGD. So there's a large amount of additive genetic effects. There is your typical E, it's that typical AE model. There's a little bit of um, non-additive genetic effects, and if we crank up the, the sample sizes, we might find some significant non-additive genetic component here, but it's not much. It's rather different for neuroticism. In neuroticism, the twin data that we have would give you your good old AE model, and that would suggest a large additive genetic component. Your GSMGD would not. It would suggest a rather large portion of non-additive genetic effects, some shared environment, and a much smaller portion of additive genetic effects than your twin data alone would suggest. And finally, conscientiousness. Again, a 66% additive genetic effects component and um, the GSMGD shows you that, again, there is a large non-additive genetic component, but it also makes a difference whether you look at twins only, at um, whether you include the twins or whether you allow separate estimates for twins and non-twins. So here we have some um, indication of a twin-specific effect. So that was a brief presentation because Tony talked me down to 10 minutes, sort of. Um, the main aim of this presentation was to show you that it is feasible, actually, to use panel data uh, and to start talking to sociologists because they turn out to be very helpful, very approachable, and very open to our ideas, I mean, ideas of genetic influences. They even go so far to be ready to include biomarkers in subsamples. Um, I think that, and it's only a, a very brief look at what could be done, that these results indicate a more complex etiology of adult personality than your typical twin design might suggest. And we've also seen some indication of non-additive genetic effects in the Dutch data. And if that is, is correct, then modeling ACE or ADE will give you a very biased idea of what is going on. Also, if you, if you take on board 
data from panel studies, they try to make sure that their sample is representative, something that we typically do not have when we use, with, use volunteer twins. And again, without a twin register, such as in Germany, you really have to ask twins, would you like to participate? And then there is selection, of course. At this stage, of course, there's many limitations. We have lots of discussions, how to deal with uh, certain issues, how to, for example, use only a fraction of the siblings. Would you want to use more? Would you restrict the age difference between the siblings you want to look at to one year, two years, or oh, what, what have you? So I think what I'm presenting today is a bit of the tip of the iceberg, really, um, and there's much more to be done, particularly uh, because there are concerns. If you think of panel studies, the measures they use are typically rather small or short. So um, uh, would you be happy with a three-item personality scale? Would you want to have another item? And that's really the dimension you discuss. Could we include yet another item? It's not like, could you include another 80-item scale? But then again, um, we use exactly these short scales to look at the... Uh, etiology in the twin subsample, and they give you the same result as your neo-FFI or other instruments. Um, yeah, I mentioned that before. So really, um, tying in with what uh, Keller um, said when, when they asked the question, are extended designs worth the trouble? I'm sure they are. It's just rather difficult to, to run a very, very decent longitudinal extended twin family design study we are just in the process of applying for one, and it's simply a lot of money. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. If you have that money, that's great. And I believe that these designs are helpful and necessary. But if you do not have these designs at hand, and if you don't have that money at hand, it might be a nice first step to bring in data from sociological studies. So I do believe that that GSM-GD approach might be a way for some of you who are doing twin studies only at the moment to extend your data sets. I'd like to express my thanks to Christa Cantor from Bielefeld University for helping with the analysis and also to uh, Thomas Siedler, Gerd Wagner and Jürgen Schupp from the German Institute of Economic Research because without them we wouldn't have understood their data set.